Welcome to this webisode for Roche's Virtual International Experience Exchange for Patient Organizations. With IEPO 2020 having gone fully virtual this year, we have turned the content of what would have been discussed in Berlin into exciting virtual formats. Webisodes like this one have replaced the six original learning labs. They feature members of the IEPO community and are available for viewing or download on IEPO.com. They contain discussion questions, and links to related resources, such as posters, submitted by patient organizations from around the world. This webisode will explore the topic of benefits and challenges of electronic health records. And I'm really happy to welcome Rachel nissenholz ganot and Stefan Geisels, who will be discussing what we as patient organizations can do to ensure that these electronic health records reflect patient needs. Rachel is head of the Health System Management Department at Ariel University. A lawyer by training, her research focus is on health policy issues, as well as medical ethics and patient-centered care, and she is a volunteer at a patient organization. Stefan is CEO of Digestive Cancers Europe, the umbrella organization for all digestive cancer patient organizations in Europe. He is himself a metastatic colon cancer survivor, and he is also the co-chair of the Patient Advisory Committee of the European Cancer Organization. Stefan, let's start with the first topic. What are the benefits of electronic health records? The benefits of, of electronic health records for patients are uh, you know, very powerful. Actually, it's, it's on one single tool, it's on my iPhone. I have immediate access at any time, wherever I am, to all the data of the treatment that I received, uh, my cancer treatment, but also uh, eye surgery that I had afterwards. And uh, I ruptured my Achilles heel earlier this year. So all the colonoscopies, all the gastroscopies, all the CT scans, all the MRI scans, all the visuals are on this uh, little tool. So all the information about my health is available there. Just like my appointments are available, the contact details of the doctors and the nurses in case I have questions. So it's an incredible source of information that also gives me the opportunity if I go to another place, you know, if I would go to, to visit uh, Rachel in Israel, for instance, and something happened to me, I could go to the hospital and share the rights that I have on my data with a treating physician um, you know, in, in Israel. And I think that is a fantastic opportunity because it, it, you know, it's all centralized in one place. It's always available and I don't have to go back to the hospital uh, to retrieve data and give it to the physician. No, I have it at hand and I think that is a, a fantastic value for a patient. I think one another advantage uh, for me is that, you know, during the consultation you have with a physician, it's not always clear to understand what is being said because you're in an emotional state. And then afterwards, when you're back home, you're wondering what <laughs> was it again that he said and how do I interpret that? Uh, the advantage of the electronic health record that is you have the full report on there. So you can go through it again. You can read uh, what the exact diagnosis is, what the exact, exact treatment is going to be. So it's a, it's a wonderful, you know, reference for, you know, any question you may have in the future. Uh, it also has all the access data, uh, contact details of the entire staff of the, of the hospital. So if you have any question, whether nutritional or from a psycho-oncology perspective or uh, any other practical uh, information you need, you can always access this because it's all in one location. So um, from the system point of view, I think electronic health records has several benefits. It helps us to, makes us to better, better clinical decision making. It makes us, it helps us to avoid mistakes. It helps us to, uh, to do less reuse of resources. For example, if you go and you do an ultrasound and the community, and then you go to the hospital, they can look at your ultrasound, they can see what kind of problem do you have, what kind of um, medication you take, and it helps uh, to the physician and to the system. I think that uh, it also can help us to do research in a better way, and uh, both we, we can both find uh, a medical trials for patients. We can use the data to find a new medication, and I think that this is a very important benefit, which is not used enough. 
in the Electronica Health Records. Yeah, I fully agree with you, Rachel. I think this is uh, absolutely critical and possibly one of the biggest untapped uh, potentials of uh, electronic health records is once you uh, connect them all, uh, once you, you know, aggregate all the data, it gives a fantastic tool for researchers, but also for the Ministry of Health to look at the collective data and, you know, see some patterns in it and, and you know, look retrospectively on, you know, where best outcomes are generated, you know, what are these hospitals doing to generate these, these good outcomes, uh, what types of treatment lead to the best results. So all that can be deducted and inferred from the aggregated data. So I, th I, yeah, I fully agree. I think this uh, systems approach is really a good one. There's also one thing that I can tell you. Uh, we're doing a research uh, with GPs. And one of the questions we ask them is about how they use the electronic health records. And they say that it enables them a more reliable prescribing so they can see what, what's going on with the patient and give them the right medication. So I think it's another very important benefit. So over to you now. This is your chance to share your thoughts in your group discussions. And these questions should help to get you started. What about the experience in your country or your region? How do you use electronic health records in your region? So um, in Israel, we have uh, four HMOs. HMO, it's, it's the health fund. Health maintenance organization is a supplier. They are the suppliers of the, of the medical uh, um, services. And each one of the people, every, every, every person in Israel has health insurance at one of the, of the HMO, okay? So each HMO has developed a computerized system to collect its patient's data. And also hospitals uh, have developed a speci uh, their own system to aggregate the data, to use it, to develop, and to learn from it. The problem is that they didn't talk to each other. So if you were going to the doctor at the community and then go to the hospital or go to a surgery at the hospital and go back to community, there was no continuity on the, of the treatment. So what the Ministry of Health has done, they developed a national platform that can connect all the systems, collect the data and show it in different locations. For example, if I go to my GP, I can see all, he can see all the, uh, all the um, data, what happened to me wherever I was. And also if you go to a hospital and for me and, and for the patients, we could see the data in my computer, in my uh, cell phone as well. So, this platform gives us the ability to, uh, to use the data. So over to you now. What are the features you would like to see for future electronic health records? When I dream of a, a faraway future, uh, I think electronic health records should be actual the, the patient's data platform. I think uh, patients should also be able to use it for their own personal preferences. You can track your physical activity with it uh, and, and other things that are really important to you as an individual patient so that you can measure progress as you move forward. So these are elements that are actually a little bit outside of the clinical uh, requirements of, of uh, the current electronic health records, but it makes it a more meaningful tool for the patient so that they can work with it on a day-to-day -day basis for you know any topic that is uh, of of interest to them and i think that uh, you know will also make it possible afterwards if you aggregate information to see uh, you know which treatments also improve quality of life uh, outside of the the pure clinical outcomes i can say that uh, in israel for example uh, you can look at your blood test you can ask the physician for prescribing medication you can ask him a question if you're not sure if you need to do something or not uh, so it's it's a platform of talking with the uh, with the physician and it also gives your physician the ability to send you 
um, tips. Like for example, if you have uh, cancer, digestive cancer, and he saw research about uh, uh, that it's not good, good for you to eat something, he can tip you. I mean, he's like, so it's very easy because he knows all his patients who has this problem and he gives them the, this tip through their, uh, this platform. So the tool, the electronic health record, can also be a data uh, information source for patients on what can you ask your, your treating team. Uh, because patients are very often in a, in a very subservient or almost victim role. You know, you undergo the entire process. Um, you're not in control. And by having the questions in advance, you know what to ask to the doctor uh, and, and the other members of the team. It gives you a, a, a sense of control over managing your disease. So you can ask questions uh, and prepare the questions that you have to ask for the next appointment that you have. So I think you can make it into a very useful tool uh, and that is much better suited to patient expectations than it is today. I think if, if we can make sure that uh, electronic health record is broadened into a tool that a patient can use for their interaction with the uh, you know, a tumor board or, or medical team that's supporting them. I think it will also uh, make sure that the patient is better informed. So if we can have all the, uh, the questions that the patient can and should ask, the, the discussion becomes more driven by the patient and the needs of the patient to get some questions answered. Stefan, what are the biggest obstacles in getting to a good system of electronic health records and how can those be overcome from your experience? I think that one of the advantages of the digital space at the moment is also a big disadvantage because everybody can set it up. And we see now that uh, apps are developed by hospitals or by, by companies. Um, and then mostly the hospital is one geographic space and you have all your information and electronic health record from that hospital available. But then if I go to another hospital where I'm treated, they have a different app and the two apps are two entry points afterwards for the patient to get access to. So in, in ideal circumstances, you have only one app as a patient. I mean, I know some companies are developing apps by disease area because they want to know, you know, inform the patient about all the aspects of their disease and by in the, in the same time tracking what's happening to the patients who use the app. So I think the advantage from a company perspective, but at the same time, it complicates life for patients because they have a, uh, you know, let's say a, a colon cancer app from one company, they have a, a, an app with the electronic health record from, from the hospital. Uh, then you have your app from another hospital for another uh, disease you may have. So it becomes too complex. In an ideal situation, uh, it's up to the, to the government or the Ministry of Health to set it up and to make sure that you as a patient, together with all the hospitals and the, the different uh, stakeholders, have one access point for all your information. I think it would be uh, much less complex. I think it would be um, very useful and, and user-friendly for the patient. But at the same time, I think it would also make it more meaningful for governments to extract uh, meaningful data from. So that's a really, that's the biggest obstacle. I would call it challenge, not mm. an obstacle, but uh, okay. But uh, we face these challenges and others and as i said before in israel each one of the hmo each one of the health funds in israel has developed its own system its own app and also the hospitals and what the ministry of health did was to uh, develop a national platform that can connect to all these uh, apps to all these systems and take the data and read it and show it to the physician at the end or to the patient at the end. Uh, uh, at the end. And uh, uh, you could see it in a different location. So it, it, was easier, it was easier to use. This platform calls OFEC and now we're working on the new generation of OFEC. Uh, hopefully will be on the 2021st. It wasn't easy because some of the hospitals, the HMOs were really for it. The hospitals said, I cannot do it. It costs a lot of money. 
money was one of the challenges and the Ministry of Health actually put a lot of money and they uh, sent technicians to the hospital to help them, to teach them how to connect to this uh, uh, to the system. But um, as a lawyer, I would like to elaborate a little bit about the legal and ethical issue. So as we know, the digital information uh, may leak uh, and thereby it infringes all the a person's privacy. And it's, it's, the privacy is a very big issue uh, on this, um, on the electronic health uh, records. And we had a lot of discussions, years of, of discussions on that issue. And in the end, the solution that we created in Israel was uh, to make, first of all, to make a firewalls at the highest level, okay? But also we gave each person the ability to chose to opt out uh, of the system. We know from surveys that we've done that most patients would be willing to share their data. So in, in survey done in Europe, the 80%, 80% of patients would be willing to share their data if it uh, benefits uh, future patients or the entire patient community. I think this is uh, you know, confirmed time and time again. I think if it's that, anonymized, of, of course. Yeah, but, but it's, maybe it's in two different levels. Okay, in, in the level of the, of, of the patient, of course, I mean, I want my physician to see my data. But some patients can say, okay, he can see my data, but I don't want this data to be used to another purposes. Yeah. But what we see in, in Belgium, I mean, and we have a cancer registry that is, you know, fairly advanced. So we have, every individual has a, a national identity number. And so the cancer registry receives the information from all the different hospitals and they aggregate all the data and then they link it to the insurance, the public insurance uh, system. So they can see where patients are being treated and then from the insurance, they can see what treatments they have received. And then it's linked also to the uh, database of the Ministry of the Interior. So they can see whether people are still alive or not. So it allows via the individual identity number to really capture all the data that are available for individual patients and allows them to make policy decisions and, and you know, you know, extract data again to, to, to have meaningful information on uh, which treatments uh, help patients or which hospitals have the best outcomes. And I think this is still an old fashioned way of, do, of looking at things, because I believe that uh, the, the patient owns the data. I think from a, you're a lawyer, you know that it's my Absolutely. data. It is my data and right. I can do with my data what I want and as I please. Well, uh, I totally agree. <laughs> we also have a national registry for cancer and uh, it's also connected to the, to the hospital. So they get the data and you can see the graphs and you can see a lot of data. But the problem is that it's a little bit old. I mean, the data there is from 2015 to 2017. I mean, it's a little bit old. It's not, it's not really up to date. And if the health organization has its patient's data here and now, he can make the decision much faster than the Ministry of Health. Yeah. And maybe coming back to a point you made earlier, and I think anybody who receives taxpayers' money to treat patients should make sure that you also measure the outcomes. And you have to make sure that the system is available to track and trace what's happening with the investments that you can make with public money. And I think that is one of the, the things that we need to emphasize uh, moving forward. Uh, we need to have accessibility of data. Well, first of all, we need the data and we have to have the accessibility and transparency of the data. So what were the key lessons learned to go from a system where there was nothing in place to where you are today? And what are the one, two, maybe three most important leverage points that we as patient organizations may have to lobby the system to do this? Okay, the all Israeli health system, it took at least 10 years uh, to go from nothing to something. What happened was that the Ministry of Health started to talk about electronic health records um, 
the idea was to make a connection between the community and the hospitals so they can talk to each other and basically see the whole data of, of the patient. So one of the HMO, they thought we need to be more computerized. So they started to become more computerized organizations. And they say, wait, if we are a computerized organization, maybe the GP can talk to the uh, orthopedist or to the, to the uh, oncologist at the, at the same organization. But the other HMOs couldn't talk to the hospitals. Also, we have different hospitals, uh, which are state hospitals. Once the Ministry of Health said, let's do it a national uh, platform, or national computerized system, they said, no, 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 this is our data. So it took a long time until the Ministry of Health came up with this solution of building a national platform. The um, goal of this platform, this OFAC plus platform, was intended only to treatment and not to other, uh, other things. So, um, that's how we started. And as I said, the legal and ethical um, questions were elaborated again and again and by persuading people and organization to understand the benefits of this, of this platform. And in the end, you know, the Ministry of Health, they said, that's what we're going to do. And you have, it, it's mandatory. Well, I, I very often say that our health system is totally irrational in the sense that there is no <laughs> right. logic between the input and the outcomes. Nobody looks at the total system of a disease, for instance. And I think that we as, as patient organizations, uh, increasingly we will become the custodian of the patient journey because we have all the information about, you know, the, the, the time it took from, you know, beginning symptoms to first diagnosis between the diagnosis and the actual treatment about the different types of treatment that were given you know, the molecular or genetic tests that were uh, asked uh, for the patients, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so we can look at this entire system and say so many things go wrong. You know, why is this possible? As a patient organization, we uh, commissioned health economic evaluation of all digestive cancers in Europe. So the total cost from a healthcare perspective in the European Union is 20 billion euro. And we know that 4 billion of that amount is wasted. These patients who get uh, the wrong treatment at the beginning or get the wrong type of surgery or are treated in, in the wrong hospital or are treated with uh, consequences, long-term consequences that could have been avoided, etc., etc. So 4 billion euro is wasted. And now I come back to the data <laughs> capture because I think the, the data capture is essential for that. Uh, if you want to know whether what you're doing is effective and efficient, you need to be able to track data all along the patient pathway. And the only single red thread throughout the patient journey is the patient himself or herself. So make sure that the patient keeps the data throughout the patient journey so that you know what are the early symptoms, what is the diagnosis, what is the treatment. And then once you have it for all the patients, you can see where is improvement possible. Where can we save lives? Where can we increase quality of life? And where can we save money? And governments are blind to that because they do not link input and outcomes. So they, they, they negotiate with hospitals on uh, the financials of performances, but they do not negotiate on the, uh, on the price of outcome. And I think our system would be much, much better off if, if uh, it was looked at in a different way than it is today. So Rachel, what are your thoughts on the future of digital health and how it enables clinical research, trial design and development? The Israeli platform is eligible, on, is eligible only for treatment and not for research, um, as for now. And I think that it is very important to use this data, and it's a lot of data, and use it for research, both in terms of finding clinical trials for patients, but also in aggregating data and do research, a real research to find a new medication, to find a new ways 
to treat patients, to understand what they want. Um, and I think by, by doing it, and we don't do it yet, and I really, um, I really expect the Israeli system to go on that direction and to help us as, as a citizens, as patients organizations, uh, as patients, um, to really be able to use this, uh, this data. Uh, we don't do it today. I think it's I think it's pity. It's really pity. Um, um, but uh, I think that one of of the things that a patient organization can do in order to promote that is to start to collecting information from a small number of patients, a small group of patients, um, and then try with with time to uh, expand the circle of patients and to get the data and to make it a platform for, uh, for research. I think the majority of research today is focused on products and technology. So it's pharmaceuticals, it's surgery, it's uh, uh, you know, diagnostic interventions. You know, all the different aspects are looked at from a technological perspective. But I think there's a lot of value to be found in the system when you look at how systems are organized. I mean, in, in a country like Belgium, uh, but it's the same in Germany, the mortality rate in some hospitals for cancer patients is 10 to 20 times higher in one hospital than in another because they're less specialized. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very important to be able to identify what lies behind that. How is it possible that you have this different in mortality based on uh, hospitals that are actually in the same healthcare system? So the, the services are reimbursed in the same way, the, the, the available treatments are identical. So what makes that difference? Uh, we also see differences in, in hospitals where shared decision-making models are applied uh, as compared to hospitals where they're not applied. So if you have aggregated data and you can look back at outcomes and then try to identify where the differences are, you know, and what you know, organizational aspects are different between the different hospitals, then you can learn something from that. So over to you now. What would be an effective way to start the conversation in your country around the need for electronic health records? Please discuss in your group. It's a very big question. Um, I think for us, this is, this is critical and we will do it in any way. What we want to do is to be, you know, having discussions with the members of the European Parliament and the European Commission at the same level. So we can provide data. We, they have to see us as a source of information and we have to work together with them to collect the data where possible. So that would not only aggregate the registries, but also make sure that is a uh, data donation program uh, organized at, uh, at the European level. Uh, obviously, with all the harmonized uh, and standardized systems behind it. So I think for us, it is already fantastic if that would ever materialize. And so we are strongly advocating for that to happen. It's very simple. It will save lives and it will save a lot of money at the same time. Because, uh, you know, as I said, we're wasting money today uh, for lack of, of uh, logic in the system. I mean, and it, it goes even, uh, you know, more broader than the treatment pathway. I mean, we know that uh, countries like the Netherlands in, in colorectal cancer, um, almost 50% of patients are diagnosed in stage one, uh, where treatment is uh, easy to give very relatively cheap and 90% of patients uh, survive. Uh, across Europe, it's 13% uh, of patients who are diagnosed in stage one. So what are the Netherlands doing to have that result? You know, So if everybody did what the Netherlands does, you know, 120,000 patients would not die every year. And we would save uh, 4 billion euros. One of the things that we can look at is to look at things that were dealt right, uh, a right uh, decision making and and to show that it actually um, saves money. I mean, this is another point. I mean, I absolutely agree 
that we should lobby and we should go to uh, politicians and we should uh, uh, do uh, whatever we need to do to um, to promote uh, this. But we and 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 I think that patient organization are a huge source of data. But I think they that we can also be a source of data in terms of money saving. And sometimes you should invest money in order to save it in the end. But I also think that on the patient level, we should do a lot of promotion to our patients to use the electronic health records, to understand how it works, to make them enjoy the benefits of the electronic uh, health records and uh, and to show that to show our patients how it helps them i think this is one of the missions of the mm. patients organization on behalf of the Roche global patient partnership team and the EAPO external advisory committee thank you very much for being with us today some great insights there from rachel and stefan around the prerequisites for creating a uniform electronic health record system on a national level using the israeli experience as a basis we heard a lot about tapping into the true value of electronic health records. And if you've been inspired by the conversation, you can learn more about Rachel, Stefan, and their work on IEPO.com. You can also download the e-posters to support your own learning and make the most of your own discussions. I'd like to thank our two speakers for sharing their thoughts with us. Thank you very much.